Mary Rowe. I help coordinate the Center for City Ecology. And we're thrilled to have so many of you here. Uh, it's a great moment in time in the city of Toronto, and what better occasion for us to take a moment to hear from our colleagues than the uh, 50th anniversary uh, of the publication of this book. The thing about me talking is I'll get that out of their system. Um, 50 years ago, Jane Jacobs published this book, The Death and Life of the Great American Cities. It's for sale outside. It's got a new edition with a new forward. And 43 years ago, she moved to this city. Lucky us. Each of these four mayors knew her well, and they worked with her well closely, and so we're thrilled to have them be with us uh, to talk to us about Jane Jacobs Toronto. The CCE is about connecting the different aspects of city life, uh, because Jane coined this term a city's ecology, the different ways in which physical form, built form, economics, and the way that we relate to one another and make decisions form ecology. And that's what the CCE is based upon. Um, we've got a number of programs, in-person programs like this. We've been convening for a number of months. Many of you have come to those. And then we have a number of online programs as well. And that little card you were given when you came in plugs those, the online programs, which include a matchmaking site where professional planners and designers can find communities that need help and communities who want some help from professionals where they can find each other. And also something that we're just launching today called the City Builder Network, where each of us need to be putting online what we offer to the city, how do we contribute, and what are our areas of interest. And then we're going to be able to show what a robust, strong, civil society we have here in Toronto that build the city. So I encourage you to go online to our website, look under our work, it's cityecology.net. You'll also see that we do other events on Saturday. Some of you, I'm sure, are coming to our first city builder camp, where communities are going to be interacting with one another and with professional designers to talk about different kinds of things they'd like to see happen in their neighborhoods. And on the 22nd of October, we're hosting the annual... That's the subway, that's not my mind. <laughs> I'm old enough. I've, I've been away from you too long enough that I sort of forgot about the subway, but we'll all be remembering that the subway runs in the deep end. Um, on the 22nd of October, we are hosting something called INBI, which stands for Yes in My Backyard. It was started by Christina Zeiler at the Gladstone, and it's moved over to 401 Richmond, and the CCE is helping produce that. So it's also online. It's on that card. It's the 22nd of October. Um, I want to thank Swipe Books that is making available this book, the one I just talked to you about, and also a book called Ideas That Matter, The Worlds of Jane Jacobs, which is just being reprinted within the last few days by the Ginger Press over here. We appreciate the efforts of Ginger Press and Swipe to make these books available to you, and I hope you'll take advantage of uh, purchasing one or two. Um, the support for the setting up of the CCE has come from the Urban Space Property Group, and specifically Marty Zyler and the Zyler family, some of whom are here with us. There really isn't a better example of city builders than the Zyler family. We want to thank them for all the early <laughs> Um They really embody the Jacobsian approach to city building, which is part of what we're here to talk about. Also today, tonight, for this event, we've got a number of groups that came in and helped to sponsor it. That includes the Canadian Urban Institute, um, many of whom you're familiar with, it, and the City Centre here at the University of Toronto. Thankfully, David and Eric came to my aid when we realized that the response to this event was going to outgrow the space that we had at the Urban Space Gallery, where we tend to post things. And David has said, absolutely, we'll find whatever space we can at the UT, so thank you uh, very much. Um, you can see we have cameras here, and, and I'm afraid my uh, fellow presenters are lamenting the fact that they've got to deal with these lights. That's because Sal and Camden is donating uh, their services to create a fabulous video uh, podcast broadcast, uh, and they're milling around. And also, thanks to our friends at Rogers, they are covering the event and will create an hour long program for next month so that people that couldn't get here today can hear it. We can all watch again. And again, which is one of the great things about Rogers, if you miss it once, you'll catch it again. Um, thank you all uh, for being here and helping us uh, support this event and make it possible. Um, I also want to thank the CCE staff and volunteers, which we have many, you'll know. You can see the CCE is comprised of a really diverse mix of folks and a key staff person who's leading them, which is Heather Ann Caldwell, so I just want to thank them. Now, to the event of the evening, tonight. Uh, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the publication of Death and Life, could you turn off your cell phones so that Mr. Payton will relax and there will be no buzzing in his ear? Um, we appreciate your support of CCE, so as you're leaving, uh, buoyed up by the inspiration of these folks, uh, it would be great if you drop.
drop a few bucks in the uh, donation uh, uh, container to help us continue to bring good events to to the CCD. And uh, would you welcome, please, Mayor David Crombie, Mayor John Sewell, Mayor Art Eggleton, and Mayor Barbara Hall. Moderator, our friend from TDO, Steve Payton. Thank you, sir. Thing I think I've ever moderated a sense around, but this is a new experience, and we'll give this a whirl. You can hear the subway going on the every 30 seconds. We'll do the best I can. Uh, simple format tonight, everybody. We're going to give each of our ex-mayors about uh, five minutes, six, seven minutes to just sort of set the table for a discussion to come. We'll get into some discussion here, and then we very much hope that you will uh, add your voices to the mix. We have microphones up in the middle there, in the middle there, and at a certain point, I'll give you the high sign to go line up and ask your questions as well. So, why don't we start? Should we go in chronological order here? David Crowley, you want to get us started? Please welcome David Crowley. Uh, uh, I guess I should uh, at least uh, explain a little where I first uh, close pulled back to Jane Jacobs. I was a teacher at Ryerson, uh, teaching political science and uh, introducing my students to the intricacies of federalism, the role of the government generals, and other exciting topics. And after a particular class, a group of journalism students, some of whom you know by now, uh, came to me and said, This is awful. Um, we are probably going to get jobs at some city hall or some small town, some city. Would you tell us about city hall, how it works? Um, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't even know where to go. Because in those days, urban affairs was having a, a very early beginning. The phrase was hardly in, in use. Um, so I went over to the bookstore uh, and uh, picked up two books, both of which were published in, in uh, 1961, which was 1963. Um, and one was uh, uh, Rachel Carson's uh, uh, Silent Spring, and the other was uh, Jane Jacobs and uh, the Death Life of Great American Cities. And, and, and then I went down to City Hall and met a man by the Matthew B. Wasp, who was the planner. And he gave me a lot of literature, and out of that I fashioned five lectures on City Hall. I thought I was do, doing <coughs> something that was normal, but it was pretty exciting stuff, and it got me and other people interested. Uh, in what Jane Jacobs had to say. And, and it was about four or five years later, and Jane came in 1968. Uh, issues were, during that time, there was a ferment in the city, which those of you who were part of it will remember well. It was a, a tremendously uh, open, exciting time in which to, we thought we could sort of fashion the city that we wanted to live in in the future. It gave us a great sense of, uh, of being able to actually do something about the place we're living in. Uh, Jane, when she came, dove right into that firm. Uh, and of course, all the things that she talked about in the books, and all the things she, she organized throughout her life, the, the topics that she was interested in, became part of the stuff of the politics and the government of the 1970s. Uh, if I had to, to uh, pick three things that were really important, at least to my experience with Jane Jacobs. Uh, one, uh, uh, the ideas that mattered to Jane uh, were the ideas that mattered to you. It mattered because they were on the street. They were part of a dialogue. Jane Jacobs never looked for disciples. She looked for dialogue. She was looking for having an understanding of the ideas that arose from observation and experience. And and, and, and therefore, it was dialogue that gave those ideas strength. In many ways, Jane Jacobs didn't give us the ideas of the late 60s and 70s. She did some of that. But she certainly affirmed our instincts as we discovered what we thought was important for the future of the city. The second thing that was really important with Jane Jacobs, and that anybody who knew her and worked with her would know, there was a very close second to ideas. The thing that mattered to her was tactics. <coughs> she loved tactics. She loved strategy. She loved uh, trying to figure out how you were able to take these ideas and move them into reality. 
and she spent many nights, she spent as many nights talking about how to do that as she did about the ideas that we were trying to implement. I think the third thing that it's hard to put the Jane was she wouldn't have used the word herself, but for me at any rate, she was kind of like there was a there was a kind of mother superior thing about her. <laughs> um, she was a she was a nephesist. Uh, she really believed that was there was a there were moral choices to be made, even in the most mundane, perhaps, policies. And therefore it gave us a great set strength that not only were the ideas important and that we should spend time trying to implement them. But we were we were morally right and on God's side. So I love her ever since. <laughs> David Brown, everybody. Please welcome John Sewell. My interest in city politics began in 1966. I was walking down University Avenue. I ran into a friend who said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm articling, and so I'm almost finished law, and I can become a lawyer next spring. And he said, oh, that's perfect, because I've been working in this community, and I need some legal advice at meetings that residents are having. Can you come and give them legal advice? Well, of course, as a young law student, you know everything about law, so therefore I said, of course I would come. The meeting was around the area of Parliament and Queen Street, and the people were going to be expropriated by the city for a big urban renewal project. I couldn't believe what was happening. And so I immediately decided I'm going to become a community organizer in this area, which is in fact what I did as I completed my legal studies, and then I became a full-time organizer. And of course, we were learning how the city actually worked and these unbelievable plans that the city had for that community. Tear it down, add it to Regent Park. Wow, we thought this is absolutely crazy. So we worked very, very hard on it. A couple of years later, I ran across this book, Death and Life in Great American Cities. I thought, well, I know all this stuff. And in fact, I did. I discovered a whole bunch of that stuff. That all this talk about good planning was absolutely crazy. The planners didn't know what they were doing. They weren't willing to listen to people. They weren't willing to good to build really good neighborhoods. So when I first came across Death and Life in Great American Cities, it was a confirmation of a lot of the things that I've learned during that, that two or three years of organizing before I got hold of the book. So to that extent, the book was really important because no one else was paying much attention to us. City Hall thought we were really stupid and, and dumb by not agreeing to have all these houses torn down and people moving on. Of course, as a result of that, I got to meet Jane, we worked together with many, many other people on, on trying to defeat the Spadina Expressway, which finally happened. But because of that, in fact, as David said, I learned she was a great tactician, involved her in the discussions about South St. Jamestown, where we were, again, doing some fairly serious community organizing. And also in respect to another community, I'd started to organize rumors at the corner of Dundas and Sherburne Streets. So I started that in 68 or early 69, and then I got elected at the end of 69. David got elected then, too. Right. We were both young workers now. Art, too. Art, too. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I'd been organizing these guys, and a developer came along and proposed three 30-story towers for the east side of Sherburne north of, of Dundas Street. And we took it to the Ontario Municipal Board, and guess what? We won. They were the days, I'll tell you, when the ONB actually listened to them. But sure enough, the developer decided to come back. And in early 1973, David had just been elected mayor, uh, in December of 72. Early 73, the developer came forward and he said, well, I'm just going to tear down the houses and build two 30-story towers, which I think I can do within the bylaw. A hoarding went up around the site. I decided, my goodness, we've got to do some organizing. So we got a whole bunch of people out there, and on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday, we actually had about 100 people out on the street at 6.30 in the morning so that we confronted those workmen when they came, and in fact, every day they went away. And then on Friday, we again were out there, strong as ever. Jay was there every day. And all of a sudden, we looked over the fence on that Friday, and we saw that, in fact, the workmen were beginning to tear down the porch of a house that, I think it was 251 Sherburne, which, in fact, had been built by um, 
Enoch Turner, the guy who formed the first public uh, school in Toronto. That was where he lived. And I saw them tearing down the roof, and I thought, what are we going to do? And I turned to Jane, and I said, Jane, what do we do now? They're starting to tear down that house. Well, she said, if you're going to tear down a property in Toronto, you have to have a hoarding around it. So if we want to stop the demolition, we've got to tear down the hoarding. <laughs> oh, I said, Jane, wait a minute. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's starting to create laws. Look at John. She says, you want to stop the demolition? Tear down the hoarding. So I got everybody together and stood and said, okay, folks, we're going to tear down the hoarding. We tore down the hoarding. The workmen went away. I phoned David in the mayor's office, who at that point was negotiating with the province to see if we could buy the site. We, we bought the site from the province, and that became City Home's very first non-profit housing program.
quickly, the term urban renewal gave way to the term uh, neighborhood improvement. Uh, so those are three areas that have been quite valuable in terms of the success and the quality of life that Toronto enjoys today. And a lot of the credit needs to go to Jim Jacobs for that. Great. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> actually, 1969 was probably the first time I voted. <laughs> I also met Jane Jacobs. I had moved to Toronto in my early 20s and I was working in the East End, Cabbage Town, uh, as a youth worker. And uh, someone I'd been involved with in the Company of Young Canadians, George Martel, was giving a course at Atkinson, up at York, called Poverty and Social Change. And he would bring an assortment of speakers in every night for the for the course and somehow or other I ended up being invited to go and speak about the young people, the the uh, youth that I was working with on the streets of Cabbage Town for the first hour and Jane Jacobs came for the second hour and I stayed to listen to her and one of the things that I was most excited about was the fact that she was the first person I met who had written a book. <laughs> 1969, not so much can live around, and here was someone who had written a book, and I bought it and went home and, and read it. I grew up all across Canada. My dad was in the Navy, so I grew up in Halifax and Victoria and Ottawa. And we'd also lived in London, England. The Canadian communities I lived in were, were post-war suburban neighborhoods. But in London, as a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old, it was very exciting to live in Chelsea. We walked down King's Road to school every day. And when I read The Death and Life of Great American Cities, I suddenly knew for the first time why I had loved London so much, as opposed to Manor Park or the neighborhood in Halifax where, where we lived. It was the diversity of, of the community, the sense of vitality in life, the diversity, the mix, the old and new, the street life, all of the things that Jane talked about. So I understood in terms of the working of a city, and up until that point, I think it's fair to say, I had never really thought about how you built cities or made them work or, or issues there. Art mentioned eyes on the street, and that's certainly an area where Jane changed my thinking and influenced a lot of the rest of my life and my time at City Hall working on issues of public violence, particularly against women and all the work we did at, uh, at the Safe City Committee, really looking at street safety not from the perspective of what women were being told by police at the time was don't go out at night or have your husband, boyfriend, father, or brother meet you at the subway. But rather, we were looking at how you could design and build cities that would create welcoming, safe, healthy neighborhoods. And throughout all of that work, as well as when I headed something called the National Strategy on Community Safety and Crime Prevention, when I worked with communities right across the country to take the issues as Jane 
had written up them and developed them about how to build a safe, safe community. So that was a big piece of um, how she influenced me. And there are so many examples of, of where that played out in, in Toronto. And I'll speak later about Dufferin Grove Park in Uda Mason, which was a wonderful uh, example of, of Jane's influence. Um, the third area where, where she influenced me was when I was there in terms of how to get the city coming to grips with the fact that on the edges of the core, very close to downtown, old obsolete manufacturing buildings were being torn down for surface parking lots because the rigid zoning was not permitting anything to happen. We talk about the Kings, the development of um, two residential neighborhoods, work neighborhoods, business neighborhoods, really vital, active neighborhoods around King and Spadina and uh, King and Parliament. The transformation of those areas, which are relatively recent, very much were influenced by Jane's ideas, as well as her actual participation, because she was a part of a, an advisory group I put together when I was elected mayor to uh, make some things happen and how to protect the, the core of, of our city. So almost every day, as I move around the city, I see things that are there because of Jane's intervention or because of Jane's influence of people like me. We have a lot to thank her for in Toronto. Thank you. Given that you knew her, and given that you understood her principles, what, when you look at our city today, do you look at and say, Jane wouldn't like that? <laughs> okay, did you want to get us started? <laughs> what, what was she like? Um, I think it's hard. Probably hard for me to pick one specific one thought. But but I think that she understood the importance. I said it before and I would underline it. She really understood the importance of dialogue and making sure there was public participation and public discussion of issues. And in the in, 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 in the recent past, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we've had a demonstration. Uh, of the of people sometimes forgetting the value of having the public discussion, hearing from officials, hearing from experts, but having them on the ground, having to, to talk with and speak with uh, people who are trying to live in this city on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think that she would probably say, we need more public discussion before we do things that are irrevocable. Or so all night sessions at City Hall, would that be a good idea? <laughs> if it's dull, she, if she, would, that, she wouldn't have minded it so long as she won at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't... My job. Go ahead, John. Well, I mean, I, there's no question she really valued uh, discussion, public discussion, because I think she thought, and I think correctly, that too often the people making the decisions hadn't looked at what was actually on the ground and how things happened. Instead, they approached it with a grand theory about how the world should work. And if there's anything Jane believed in, it's you had to look at what was there and figure out what was working and what wasn't working from what was right in front of you and make your decision accordingly. Planning, she said, never did that, and it's true. Planning was this insane idea at the end of the 19th century where people came in with big theories, whether it's Ebenezer or Howard or whether it's LaCorte Bussier, they had nothing to do with reality and it should wreck a lot of things. So, I mean, like, if there's one thing Jane wouldn't like, it's what's around 
the, the old city that was built in 1945. Single-use suburban stuff forever and ever. I mean, you know, I'm one of those who believe that Jane has not had a lot of influence at all in Toronto. If you read Death and Life in Great American City, she says there's four principles of good city building. Short blocks, mixed uses, medium densities, and a mixture of old and new. We don't have those principles in any official plan anywhere in the GTA. Nobody cares about them. And that's an example of what little legacy, how small we actually treat her in real life. I think we say, oh, she's a nice woman and she had good ideas, but in fact, we implemented none of them. A second idea that we never implemented, not in death and life, is the whole idea of import replacement as a way to create jobs. That the way you actually create jobs is not inventing something new, but replacing locally something that was imported into the area. The best example we have of that, of course, is the wine industry in Niagara. They never invented wine, but they said, gee, they're making this thing in France, could we make it here? And in fact, we've created a lot of jobs. We do not have any economic development program in Ontario, in any municipality, based on import replacement. Even though she's made it perfect here, that's something that in fact is the way that jobs actually get created. So, I, I'm very worried about that. It's the old city of Toronto where Jane Jacobs principles are still alive, but the rest of the GTA, they're absent? Well, remember, you're talking about the urban core versus the suburbs, and I, I think uh, much of what uh, from Jane is relevant to the urban core. I, I think I might have a disagreement with John at one point here. I think Region Park is perhaps a good example of getting away from a plan that I'm sure she would have thought was a Garden City type of uh, planning concept. Now, I don't know that she necessarily would have liked it, was about to replace it, but it still would have brought it. It brings back uh, more interaction amongst people on the street level, uh, shorter blocks, and brings, it takes us out of the uh, kind of uh, development that has really failed, failed us in terms of uh, that part of the area. And there seems to be a fair bit of enthusiasm by a lot of people that live there about this uh, redevelopment, which means that they've been part of that uh, planning, and they're also part of living in it, and will be part of living in it in the future. It's still kind of early to determine whether it uh, will work out uh, totally, but I, I, I think it's in the right direction. Uh, if uh, she were with us today, uh, she would probably look uh, at the mayor and say, you want to do what? <laughs> uh, I think she'd be horrified by this plan to change uh, the waterfront. Uh, uh, <laughs> Violates so much of what so many of us have stood for for so long. Uh, uh, it's a well developed plan. Uh, yes, it takes a long time to implement it. Remember, the area that we're talking about here is the same size as the whole downtown area. Or Front Street, up the Sherbert, and back. That's an enormous area. So, of course, it's going to take a number of years uh, to develop it. And I think they're developing it in the, uh, the right direction. I think what she got picking up on David's point, uh, from five to with, with four, is the fact that this is a, you know, after there's a plan in place, there's a piecemeal approach to go about and change it all in uh, so many ways that I think they're uh, very dangerous to the fabric of this and you say, Jane wouldn't like that. Well, I walked through St. Jamestown this morning and she didn't like it and wouldn't still in terms of the design and the absence of roads. John Sewell tried to put streets back into that community and rationalize all the open space that uh, nobody owns or uses or has access to really that's just a wasted resource and all the people in those buildings crave some open green green space and St. Jamestown is an example in the core of the city. There are many, many examples in the, the uh, 
more suburban communities around the former city of Toronto, and uh, she would continue to hate those and really feel despair for the, the thousands of families who have to live in those communities with so little access or services or sense of, of, of security. Um, well, I've been advised that the sound in here with the subway and everything is not great, so if everybody can use the hand mic when they speak, you, you, know, you three can use that. The one good thing about what Ford is doing is that <laughs> 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 he's going to make sure the subway doesn't run us off. <laughs> related to that, which often goes hand in hand with the, the wine areas, but certainly uh, that's an example. And I know a number of people who've been active in that have in fact received Jay Jacobs awards over the years, the farmer's market, all of them, the things related to, to local food. Well, let me pick up on that, and uh, David probably will answer the mic saying, what new initiative do you look at that has happened since all of you left the bear's share, and you think it's going to be the realm of speculation here, that's a good idea, and Jane would have liked that. I think if there's one thing that changed over her lifetime here, uh, it was all over foot, but changed the, 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 the place forever. And that is that the, the, the social diversity of the place is absolutely amazing. We, we live in it every day, so we're not used to Kick the mic up, audio guy. Hello? Can you hear now? Close into your face. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello? Say something. Come on. Um, I forgot what I said. Uh, I'm old now, so. Uh, but I, I, I think that one thing we take for granted every day. Uh, that, that Jane would, would have loved and actually spoke on a number of occasions is the incredible social diversity of this place today. It is the one chief characteristic, I think, that has changed, changed us significantly. Okay, a quick story. What if my daughter's married to her region? Not my fault. <laughs> and she lived, in, she lived in Bergen for nine years and raised two little kids. Brought them over here just a couple years ago. She wanted to, she lives in, in Duffin Grove Park. It was down to Houston Street Public School, which has been there about 125 years. The kids, uh, first language, two kids, the first language is Norwegian, the second language is English, and a bit of German. Uh, and this is a version, so she's a little worried for little kids. Should she, how many languages should she have running around in her head? So she talks to the principal, and he takes her around to the classroom. And she said, you go in here, in Houston Street Public School, it looks like the UN has come to play. <laughs> And every, kids were everywhere. And she said, you look around, every one of those kids are on the third and fourth language. And, and I thought to myself, when I was walking those same streets, when I was a kid in the 50s, if there was any other language, it was probably Italian, but there was no great diversity. And the, the, the way we have widened the circle, the way we have allowed, we're still yards to go, miles to go maybe. But one of the things I think that Jane would have been impressed with was the incredible source of diversity and what we've done with it. And that is something that we should be proud of, by the way. I should correct one record here. I think, didn't you just say in the middle of that, I'm old now? Yes. You, you're, you're only 75, aren't you? Okay, he's only 75, so let's not get carried away. I must say I have trouble thinking of that. <laughs> she thought thinks the mega city is a total disaster, and in fact she defined how you govern cities at the end of the death and life of Great American City. Spectacular chapter on how you govern big metropolitan areas, and you know people pay no attention to that. She thinks that cities should have more power to do things, but they don't. Um, and in fact, the, the mayor is not willing to ask for more powers of taxation or things like that to actually get to govern themselves. 
I think, you know, Systems of Survival, she talks about the crossover between the Guardian and the, and the commercial interests. And I think governments are starting to do a lot more of that, and so she'd be worried about that. So I, I'm a negative in terms of what Jane would be happy about. I mean, I agree on the diversity. I know at the end of her life, she was going out to Brampton to see what kind of industries were actually happening there and talking to the, the business people out there, most of whom were not Anglo-Saxon, and she was really happy about that. So I would agree with David on that point. All right. Liveliness, the, the, the dynamic uh, core that we have, the city particularly the plan that hopefully is going to survive while making waves. Uh, I, I think it's a terrific plan that will bring a lot of additional housing, uh, housing for different incomes, and that's something that I, I think she would very much like to see. And that's one of the things that we were able to bring about the central area plan came into effect was a lot of uh, mixed housing. We need more of that now because one of, one of the great problems we have in the city is we have a, an income disparity that is growing larger and larger all the time. Uh, David Ochansky who's here, has talked about the three cities in Toronto, the fact that uh, we have uh, a core, um, places like here, that uh, people are fairly well off. We have people way in the outlying areas uh, who don't have nearly the urban transportation that we need who are much poorer, and we have a middle class that's been shrinking. Sean, when we were first on city council back in the 70s, the middle class was about 66%, now it's 29%. Uh, the neighborhoods of people of low income at that time was 19%, it's up to 53%, and we've got a priority neighborhood program, which I also hope is going to survive. So I think we've got threats to the fabric of the city, to the social cohesion of this city, and I think uh, those are the things that are going to need attention to the city to continue to be the success it has been. Barbara Hall, something she would have liked? And she would like the fact that so many more people are now living downtown and walking to work and that there's a battle between grocery stores in the downtown of the city. For many, many years, the only thing grocery stores did south of Bloor was clothes. Um, and now, because of the increase in population, there are all kinds of things that people need when they live in, in a community. So that kind of in, infrastructure is emerging. and particularly that so few of the people in those neighborhoods uh, use cars to get to work or about their, their life and are walking there. I think one thing she would feel sad about in terms of the redevelopment in those areas is that there's not a lot of income diversity because at the time all of those buildings were being restored or built, there were vir virtually no social housing programs in this community. And had there been, then we would have been able to create neighborhoods more like St. Lawrence that my colleagues were such a part of, which really does have a diversity of uh, income, living well in a, in a mixed downtown community. David Crumby, would you be any more content with how the mega city is now operating 10 years in? No, I think she probably would be with John, uh, and that is that it's been a disaster. Uh, amalgamation was a disaster, the down downloading was a disaster, that, and the 10 years has not fixed it. Uh, so I, I don't think that she'd be happy with how it worked out. She was opposed to uh, the amalgamation at that time, and uh, uh, I think that, that, that she would not be happy with what she's seen. That, that's not my guess. Council, would she be any happier with the way it's working out? Oh, I, I think she'd be absolutely devastated. I mean, the fact that the Toronto City Council is now taken over by people living outside of the, the old city of Toronto, uh, and unfolding this insane agenda. I mean, you know, if there's any legacy, it would be to 
say, hey, you know, there's something happening down there at City Hall. And what are we going to do? Aren't we all going to do something about those people? We should all phone them and email them and make sure we go down to meetings. And if she was here, that's what she'd be saying. She'd be saying, let's get together, folks. Let's do something. Nobody else is going to do it. We have to do it. And, I mean, if there's any message that I think we can deliver tonight, it's okay, folks. It's up to us. We're going to have to really go after that city council in the next 10 days. I think she's probably be talking to Paul Bedford about his plan to reform uh, the amalgamated city. I mean, there's no use talking about... Uh, it's happened, it's happened. How do we make it better? That is what we need to talk about now. Uh, and uh, Paul came out with a plan last fall that said, look, it's, uh, we need to have some de decentralization of a lot of the uh, uh, planning that goes on, particularly relevant to neighborhoods, uh, that we need to have more of the community council kind of uh, concept. Uh, we need to also, on the other side of the coin, have some people elected to city council who have a city-wide perspective because everybody gets elected now except for one person. I uh, get elected on a ward basis and they're prime concerned to look after the particular needs of their board. But who, who looks after the city-wide interests? Well, you know who. Uh, <laughs> uh, who has the vision for the city? Well, yeah, you know who. Uh, so, what Paul was suggesting that we, we have some districts in which we would have certain councils elected and they would uh, they would be there not to look after the work politics, but they would look after a broader uh, citywide perspective. Now, I, I think a lot of that fits with uh, what Jane was used to in New York, the kind of organization that they had in that city. And I think uh, we need to look now. We're not going to undo it. Let's now look at how we make it a lot better. Is to the diversity of the population. I think what would please Jane is that many young second generation Canadians are starting to get involved, civically involved in the community. In the last municipal election, while there weren't many of them elected. There were many fantastic young candidates from racialized communities stepping up and encouraging their, their communities to get involved in the life around them. And I think that, uh, and you know, it makes sense when people first come that they're not focused on on local issues. They're they're focused on settlement. They they see government as the as the federal government that deals with immigration and citizenship issues like like that. But I think not only would Jane uh, enjoy the diversity of the community, she also wanted to be a diversity that had a voice and an impact on the future of the community. So as, as those young people uh, get more engaged, Jane, uh, would you please, she would have supported them and we all need to too. Thank you, Carl. I, I just want to go back, Barb, I, I just want to go back to the, uh, what Jane would have thought about the mega city today and what she might do about it. Let me take a leaf from John's book. I, I don't think she would have been sitting in downtown Toronto trying to explain to those people out there that they don't really understand what city living is about, about that we do. She would have understood that to be an elitism, a snobbery, and a kind of different form of down, up, from the top down planning. She, she would have been out there trying to have discussion and dialogue with them there. Every time, here's, I think Jane would have say, do you agree, Jane, that the more we keep on insisting that we've got the truth, 
And those poor benighted heathens don't. We're going to continue to live in a world where we're going to be disappointed. The whole idea is to recognize that people who are in former suburbs are part of this city and they have the right to be respected for their views and not create cultural wars. They're going to turn around and fight our ass. So I get very concerned. And bring them in. We're always going to lose. And they, people who live in the city, the planning and the people should not be confused. They are hardworking, honest to goodness people who raise their kids, pay their taxes, and try to fashion their life best they can. And we are hurt ourselves if we take the, the legacy of Jane Jacobs and somehow turn that in to a world in which we're saying, you better figure out what we know and you'll be better off. That's not the way it's going to work. And J.J. was going to be leading the fight to have a dialogue out there with them and, and maybe bring back some of the truths that they got down here so we can learn something from them. One of the problems I think we have today in governance is that there aren't really very many places where you can have public discussions. Right? We know that public hearings are a fraud. They don't listen to anything you say. It's only you know, all for show. And very, very few elected representatives call meetings so they can actually have a discussion about things. So people can learn from each other, which I think is the point that you're making. And that's what Jane obviously believed. You have a discussion so you can learn. Uh, you know, William Lyon McKenzie, one of my heroes, the first mayor of Toronto, said, that you really never know what you think until you involve yourself in discussion with other people. And that's when you find out what you actually think when your ideas are bouncing off other people. We don't have places where that can happen anymore, which is a bit of a problem. And maybe we're going to have to start to figure out, we have to start to create those, and, and that would be something that Jane, I think, would be very happy with. <laughs> and this harkens back to almost 30 years ago when I was a younger city hall reporter covering your administration on Agatha. And Jane Jacobs was making a point at the council meeting. And I had a chat with one of your, who shall remain nameless, advisors at the time, who said to me, Jane Jacobs is wrong on this. She may be sainted, but she's wrong. <laughs> was Jane Jacobs wrong about anything that we we're talking about? We have the benefit of 50 years of hindsight here with death and life. Was she wrong about anything in hindsight? All right, I'll just take the mic from Barb Hall and start off on that. Well, the only thing I remember was that in her book she said, we've got a problem because buildings are getting higher so they've got elevators. And there's vandalism in elevators. What was her solution to this? Elevator attendance. No, it didn't work. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if any, I can't remember what my uh, assistant was thinking of. And I think uh, she and I did. Uh, not agree on everything, uh, but I think uh, we had much the same intentions in mind. Uh, I can remember, I think, an interesting debate with her. Uh, it was on a boat. Uh, we were crisscrossing the harbor, and we had a guest. It was the Queen of the Netherlands, Queen Beatrice. And the Queen liked to get into BT dialogue, substantive discussion. And she did well. Of course, she would like the mayor, that's me. Uh, the mayors always say, oh, my city's the greatest, and all that sort of stuff. She probably thinks that's what she was going to get from me. She invited Jacobs as well, so there were the two of us, back and forth, going across the waterfront, debating is that building, that area, whatever, uh, right for the city. But I, I think we had some disagreements. Uh, well, we had one. When I ran for mayor, she supported Jones. <laughs> 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 but other than that, I think we had very substantive agreement, and I think the, the principles she has taught are things that I think have uh, done very well for our city. Barbara, what was she wrong about? She was very angry at me because. Uh, I supported the fixed link to the island airport. Uh, <laughs> now, folks, we have a rule at the 
these things. You're allowed to heckle, but only if it's witty. Bullying <laughs> is not witty. <laughs>
Uh, in fact, as we know, the national government feels the same way. I mean, if there's anything we need, it's high-speed rail between here and, and Montreal and so forth. But in fact, we have not had governments willing to put that money in. And I don't believe that any asking by the city of the provincial or federal governments is going to get us that money. I believe the only way we're going to get it is by actually having our own tax sources that allow us to raise enough money here to do it. But I think that's the problem. It's the transportation dollars and those other levels of government saying, hey, not interested. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, on, the, on the transportation uh, uh, relationship to the province, uh, in our time, uh, we got 50% right, 50% on operating and 75% on capital. I mean, so so we were doing well, but we had a tremendous provincial support. 50% on operating, 75% on capital. I don't know what the, op what is it today? Oh, it's the No one knows. But that was a formula that the PTC had. So that made all the difference in terms of being able to move forward in an orderly way on the expansion of the TTC. Is there a mic down there anymore? No. Oh, there is a mic down there, but I don't know. Anyway, uh, I agree with what both uh, John and David have said about the need to have uh, new funding arrangements with respect to transit uh, and, and a lot of other things as well. If there's a fiscal imbalance in this country, it's not really between the federal and provincial governments, it's between those two governments and the municipal level of government, which uh, has really not enough to be able to do the kind of things we expect of them. But I, there's also something curious, uh, I think disturbing at the city level itself. Uh, we have this plan called uh, Transit City, uh, I didn't think it was a perfect plan, but on the other hand, it was a plan that was going to move us forward and start to, to deal with the, uh, the transportation issues we have, the public transit issues that we uh, have in the city. Well, all of a sudden, we're back to square one, so it seems. We're back to uh, really the <laughs> way so you can't make progress and you're continually going to go back and revisit all of these things. Uh, the same might be happening on uh, the waterfront, too. So. Uh, I think it's a shame that the city doesn't doesn't stick to the plan that it adopted and would have moved this forward. Urban transportation, urban transit in, in Toronto is in is in bad shape. And it's about to get worse because they're about to cut down on the, the service levels. That is absolutely the wrong direction to go. We've got too much congestion in this, this city, and we're not doing enough in terms of public transit to get it solved. Can't do it. You keep changing the plan all the time. Perfect. The former speaker said political will or lack of is a big issue. The funding formula is a big issue. I don't know the exact numbers, but I think uh, Toronto has the highest percentage of funding coming from the fair box. Uh, of any transit system in in North America. And for many years, the TTC was the leading example. I think another um, problem which influences the funding formula and political will is what we let become the 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 language or the culture around government. That government is bad, that taxes are bad, that we should be able to have services and more services but not pay for them. That public servants um, and people who provide services and make a decent wage are all ripping us off and should be uh, should be gotten rid of. So a real anti-government culture, which influences, I think, uh, the the lack of uh, political will. People are are frightened um, to put forward the kinds of capital expenditures that are required for for sustainable transportation in our region. Um.
I just want to say, Mr. Sewell, that uh, I su my group supported you in grade nine in student vote. And four years later, I got to vote for you for real. And last year, I ran in the town council election. So I blame you for that. Uh, <laughs> um, in, in Death and Life, Jane Jacobs specifically said that she did not believe that her ideas necessarily apply to anything smaller than a large city, um, and, and specifically excluded smaller towns from that, that they, they just wouldn't work. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you, to what extent do you think that her ideas should be applied to smaller cities, large towns, uh, some of the exurban areas, exurban communities like you know, Milton, Branton, Oshawa, um, or Kennedy? Thanks for the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that shot at it. I, I think that there, not every idea will be applicable to every place, but I think there was so much that she had to say, for example, about neighborhoods, that had to say about the culture of the street, uh, that had to say about participation, all of those those things that can apply to small and large scale. There are something, she, she was actually, I, in my judgment, uh, more interested in, in the, the, the dynamism of small things than she was in the in the activity of large things. Uh, I don't mean she paid no attention to the large things, but I think she had a strong interest in the smaller things. But I think they would have been more applicable uh, to, to more places. Would the Jacobs principles work for smaller things? Uh, you must remember the way that Jane worked was to look at something and say what's working and what's not working. And in Death and Life in Great American City, she was looking at big cities to see what worked. And that's why she has the proviso, hey, this might not work somewhere else. But I agree with David that, in fact, the principles that she discovered that actually are successful in big cities, I think, are successful in small places as well. Oh, yes. I think things like eyes on the street, uh, no matter what the community is, uh, the neighborhood is, uh, I think they're important for the safety of people. People have to feel safe walking up and down the street. There still are a lot of... Uh, uh, places, suburban places, uh, particularly uh, in the United States, where you just don't see or any street activity, but that's any activity at all. And I think those are important for any size of community, suburban or downtown. Me too. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think small towns, the, many of the principles apply. It really is about how does it feel? Does it how, how does it feel walking by the buildings or walking along the street? Who else is there? And why are they there? And uh, her ideas would, would explain a lot of those things. I know that many of the most successful neighborhoods in the city of Toronto um, are, people often comment that they feel like Smallest towns in a big city, that sense of engagement, knowing neighbors, knowing merchants, uh, shopkeepers. That's good to know. They call on the I tell my neighbors in downtown Milton that it feels a lot like my whole neighborhood, Parkdale. Is that where you, where, where did you run? Milton. How'd you do? Uh, third out of six against two opponents. Try again. Old white guys who sit around in a room, scratch themselves, and say, That guy looks like a ball player, let's give him $6 million. And the open day says, Hey, that's a pretty terrible way to run a business. Let's not do that. Let's get some data. Let's figure out what actually matters. And then we'll make our decisions based on that. And so the way it seems like municipal politics works, not municipal governance works, is that they're sort of still stuck in another era where there aren't testing, there, there isn't testing, there isn't experimentation, and decisions aren't made based on real data. So why do you think that is, and what do you think James has said about, about that? Is there a money ball approach to local politics we ought to be applying here? I'm sorry, I didn't. With great respect, I didn't get it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can try to answer about how I think Jane would approach how, how do you get good people running so you get oh. good city government. Oh. And in fact, here's how you do it. You say to every candidate. And short people. No. So I think what you do is you say to every candidate, okay, there's going to be a test. We're going to have five questions based on 
about how much you know about death and life in great American cities. <laughs> if you can pass that test, you're allowed to run for public office. <laughs> Go ahead. To, um, in the ideal situation, in maybe an organization or a government that was, you know, striving to create that dialogue, what would that look like? Where would the space to be for that dialogue to happen? And maybe just kind of paint a little picture of how you think that would work. We're getting well, we're that dialogue happening. About, about job creation? No, just about um, a creative dialogue about how cities, I mean, how everybody envisions their, their city to be. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, it can happen wherever people gather. I think it's looking, it could be at Tim Hortons or at the mosque or at the barber shop or beauty parlor. It can be at the community center. It can be um, on, the, on the park bench where people are, uh, are, are hanging out, I think. Um, well, I think it's, there are, uh, I think, um, traditionally, city councillors from the old city uh, did a lot more sort of community development type work with citizens than many in other parts of the city, and I think that was some of the tradition that came out of reform, reform politics. A lot of, of citizen groups, advisory groups that, that brought people together, but I think what that kind of community development taught me back in Solinsky 101 days is that you start small and you go where people are and you start to talk to them and then you look for structures you can you can build that in. And I think when the city goes out and has hearings as it's done for the last number of years around budget consultation, that those are held in rec centers or school school basements or, or gyms and lots of people come out to those things. I think it's how you approach them and what kind of issues you're you're inviting them to to come and be a part of that determines whether whether they come and as it develops I think you find ways to build it into structure. I don't think we're at that point in a lot of parts of the city yet. Sure. I'm glad while you were talking I was, I was thinking back to when I got first involved in this, and the others did as well, I guess, uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, there were there were a couple of organizations that, that went across all the neighborhoods, went across the city. One was a kind of older crowd, but they were very, they showed up in the meetings, they issued reports on what happened at meetings, uh, they made sure that there were issues during elections, they would hold forums, and that was the Association of Women Electors. You remember them? Yeah. They, I mean, they were always at one representative at the council meeting, uh, which which uh, which at least kept everybody honest because we're going to be in this little report. Uh, but but they they were across the city, and they made sure that the dialogue wasn't re only limited to local uh, uh, neighborhoods or or local parishes, whatever. They had a cross the city view. There was also another organization uh, that printed stuff. Uh, the Bureau, thank you, uh, the Bureau of Municipal Research, uh, and, and Simon Miles. Remember Simon Miles? He started it, I think. And it was sponsored by uh, by Consumers Gas and a bunch of other corporate organizations and so on. But it was a terrific place. They put out pieces of paper, studies on a number of things, which everybody read. So we were actually reading from, not all the time, everywhere, kind of all things, but there was a common text that you could get uh, from uh, the Bureau of Municipal Research. Maybe we need something like that again.
In fact, the device we used in the 70s, and David, it's where you and I first worked together, was a thing called a working committee. Right. And the secret in the working committee is that you got about 15 people together from a neighborhood or an interest group and said, we're going to sit down and work together over a series of meetings to try and figure out how to resolve some of these problems. And so we're going to get to know each other, and we're going to get to share our ideas, and we're going to get educated about this particular subject, and we're going to involve the people who make decisions at City Hall so they're part of the working committee as well. So that, in fact, we're hooked right into the power, the decision-making, as well as having local people. And it seems to me that in terms of real discussions about City Hall, that's what we have to reestablish. These things of one-off meetings, I mean, that's like talk radio, you know, where everybody blasts their opinion and they aren't around to listen to anybody else or say, oh, I never thought of it, oh, well, maybe I should, oh, et cetera. And the magic of the working committee is people get to know each other, they trust each other, they begin to share opinions, and they create some kind of consensus about big issues. We need a lot of those kinds of working committees for, for governments at all levels. And I referred to earlier uh, Paul Bedford's idea about neighborhood councils. Uh, if that kind of thing ever got going, then that would be a more formalized structure to be able to deal with city issues on a regular basis. But there's another uh, way of uh, working into issues, and that is through the universities. The uh, University of Toronto, for example, has a city center, and it does a lot of uh, research, evidence-based research, and has discussions uh, that can be quite useful in terms of dealing with a lot of the issues that uh, we face today. I want to save time for some informal chat afterwards. We want to make sure we have enough time for it. So let's do one more question here. One more question here, and then we'll call it. Okay, so go ahead. I'm going to make this a brilliant tactician. What would you say now, Mayor Ford, and what is happening now, which is such a deliberate attack on people who use public services to say that they no longer deserve them? Um, this whole the fallacy of the work on the car has enabled him to do much of this, and I'm just wondering if you can put your heads together and say what we can do to other ways, our voices, which have been silenced by the city council. Well, I think the, the thing that Jane would say is the first thing we do is have to get their attention. In fact, you know, City Hall doesn't see its role to solve any of those problems about income disparity or services. So we have to get their attention. And I think the way to do that is for all of us to start saying, okay, hey, we're going to try and get to 10 members of council, each of us, and make a personal connection and start talking whether or not we're in their ward as well. I think that's what Jane would say is the start. Once we've got their attention, then in fact we can probably get them to say, okay, you, you can't do that. Now we've got to set up processes to find solutions. I mean, the merit of the central area plan was that we put in place the 45 holding bylaw to stop things happening. And then the question is, what do we do next? Well, we had a number of working committees, Colin Vaughn, Hunter came up, leading all that stuff all across the city, meeting all the time, saying, what do we do, what do we do? And it took us about a year and a half to say, oh, here's what we did. So you get their attention first, get them to stop what they're doing, and then say, okay, now we're going to have to really sort out the hard stuff of what we do next. I think that's what Jane would say. No, no I, I, I agree exactly with that. And as John was speaking, it reminded me that our ability to do that years ago was considerably dependent on the openness of council and the, not just the people, I mean the process. The mayor had only one vote. The mayor did not have the power of appointment. When they made the change recently, they made the change to give the mayor office more power from a report done by some very nice people. What they did was create what we have today, and that is an enormous weight of opinion in the mayor's office, when the mayor should, as I'm sure we all attest, you learn more if you have to work your way through council. Because what working your way through council means is that you are now opening it up to the citizens that the councillors represent. It was interesting to note that when that came down as legislation, I went down to make a deputation and John and I were the two on that day, yeah. right? And most people thought we disagreed on things, which was true in a number of areas. But one thing we knew for sure, that the great merit of the 
Toronto system of government was that council was supreme. Not the mayor, but council. And now what we have to do is work extra hard on these issues that we know that are in the paper today to make sure that the council understands that its obligation is to its constituents and not to the mayor.
that when you're spread out thinly and there aren't corner stores, and in fact there aren't sidewalks and there aren't active streets. And that's the problem, that in fact the low density form of development in fact depoliticizes the way people look at the world and the ability that people have to think that they can change the world. And so, so I think that means it's a real uphill battle to get people who live in low density communities actively involved in city politics. I think it's really, really, really hard. And that to me is one of the great problems with those low density communities. But I have to object to say that urban forum defines the polit politics and social practices. Uh, I'm a professor at York University. Uh, we study suburbanism, global suburbanism, and uh, density does do many things, and urban forum does do contribute to that those particular perspective. But to build up this black and white perspective that was just presented by John Sewell, I completely object to that, that we have to have another time, uh, a longer discussion there. But I don't want to take anything away from the question. Uh, yes. Any question? Sir, Entice people to move to 
dense locations from the suburbs if, if they don't understand why there's danger in the, in the dense areas. Just like in the 60s, when a lot of the flight to the suburbs were due to the lack of safety downtown, uh, we're looking at it from a different perspective. Like how, how can we entice people to live in more dense areas Smart growth in that area. If, if they fear there's going to be a riot? Because there are no riots in suburbs. Because there are no riots in suburbs. <laughs> 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 yeah, in Paris, <laughs> they are. Well, John, you want to take a bite? I mean, let's face it, there's an awful lot of public housing projects that are in the suburbs, and they're very dangerous places. It's a way that's a question of how you build places. That makes them safer so that people can relate to each other in a, in a much better fashion. You must remember they built York University originally in the 60s to make sure the students could never take over a building. <laughs> and, and as we know, it was one of the most hostile environments that anybody could ever be found in. And slowly they're changing and so that it's sort of, you know, a bit more friendly to people who have to use that. <laughs> <laughs> One more when, when I stayed for the first couple of months with the friends' parents in Don Mills, and then I moved to Cabbage Town, which was pre all the, the renovators, was considered by many to be a poor community or, or a slum. And reading uh, death and life made me understand why Don Mills felt so unsafe to me and walking along Winchester or Carleton or Ontario felt so safe because there were people and there were activities and there were uh, you could there were always people within calling or hearing distance if you if you spoke loudly in Cabbage Town and in Don Mills, there was no one and the air conditioners were loud so that you could have screamed bloody murder and no one would have hurt you or come. I think if we had affordable housing in the core of the city, we'd have many, many people who would want to live here and many people who move to the suburbs regrettably because they can't afford to live that fast.